Hello and welcome to the Airline Weekly Lounge. I'm your host, Gordon Smith, and this week I'm joined by co-host Jay Shabbat. In part one, we're discussing the latest developments at Korean Air, and in part two, we'll be finding out which airlines had the most profitable start to the year. Hey, Jay, how's it going? Good, good. How are you? Doing really well, thank you. We've got two very exciting topics this week, Korean Air, and then we're going to go completely global and take a look at who had a really strong financial start to 2024, uh, Q1 to be specific. But uh, yeah, let's save that for part two. Let's start in South Korea. What on earth is going on there? Because some of our listeners might be more plugged in than others. They probably have an inkling that two of the biggest carriers, Korean Air and Asiana, are coming together if the US allows them. Uh, but there's there's a few themes to unpack. Where do you want to start, Jay? Yeah, well, there, as you say, there there is quite a, quite a lot going on uh, for K- Korean Air. Uh, interestingly enough, and this is somewhat amazing on the face of it, and I'll explain it in a moment, but uh, Korean Air actually had a better profit margin in 2020 than they did in 2019, which I don't know that there's any other airline in the world that can say that, or at least passenger-oriented airline. And I think I just gave a clue there uh, about why uh, this is the case. It has to do with cargo. Uh, Korean Air just happens to be a very large cargo carrier. Uh, it was, I believe, I'm looking for the number here. It was, yeah, 20 cargo represented uh, about 21% of their total revenues in 2019. And that even includes, uh, you know, they have revenues from, uh, uh, they have a big aerospace subsidiary, for example. They provide Boeing and Airbus with, uh, with, Various parts, and 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 they have uh, some other business as well. So even considering all that, twenty one percent from cargo. But then in twenty twenty, um, that shot up to fifty seven percent. And in twenty twenty one, when passenger demand was still very depressed, especially in Asia, seventy six percent of their revenues came from cargo. So wow. you can see how they were uh, they were able to pivot away from the depressed passenger side into cargo. And cargo during the pandemic just happened to be booming because if you think about really from both sides, the demand side and the supply side was very favorable because on the demand side, you had, you know, all these, just imagine, you know, people in, in Europe and the United States buying uh, all of these Asian you know goods produced in Asia because they couldn't travel. So they were spending their money on that. So there was a lot of you know, goods and, and uh, components and all sorts of things, electronics, uh, and even the COVID vaccines, uh, Korean Air was a big uh, uh, transporter of those. So there was just a lot of freight activity. But then on the supply side, you had all these passenger planes around the world grounded, and typically their bellies held a lot of cargo, so a lot of supply disappeared. So Korean Air just found itself in this really great place. And I'll just, uh, you know, I won't bore you too much with uh, with figures here, but uh, so they did... Um, in 2019, they had a 2% operating margin, and that jumped to, to uh, the 3%, increased to 3% in 2020. But in 2021, when they really were able to you know, just get their hands around the, uh, the cargo situation, 17%, which was the best that they had ever done in their history. I mean, the best, I believe their best year ever, and I didn't go back that that far, but I believe Korean Air's best year ever is 2016. They had a 10% margin, pretty good. Well, they did 17% in 2021. And guess what? In 2022, they did 22 percent. So this is an airline that uh, you know was never really super profitable pre-COVID. Suddenly making these you know just just incredibly <laughs> incredibly large you know fat profit margins. And you know throughout all this, their balance sheet got better, and uh, and they still continue to do well. 2023 sort of came back came down to earth a little bit. They did 11 percent, still very good. And they had a very good start um, to 2024. First quarter operating margin was very good. So uh, they, you know, a rare airline for which COVID was almost, let's call it a blessing in disguise. They're they're just in in really good shape now. Fascinating numbers, Jay. Do you think there'll be a number of CEOs, C-suites in general, who will retrospectively look at what Korean Air did and say, hang on a minute, we had a cargo operation. We already had a lot of the the pieces that Korean Air had leveraged so well during the pandemic, and of course, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Is this just a case that Korean Air got really lucky in a way that their particular uh, business structure worked very nicely for what the 
demands required of it? Or do you think they they had an additional element of foresight, which some competitor airlines that do have cargo operations of their own maybe didn't quite uh, leverage in the same way? Well, I mean, give them credit for capitalizing on a uh, favorable situation. But I think it's fair to say that they were in the right place at the right time. <laughs> they do. Yeah. They did happen to just have a very large cargo. Um, there are a few airlines around the world, passenger area airlines around the world. I mean, we're focusing on passenger here. But the passenger-oriented airlines, there are a few that have that large of a cargo business. Now, there are others, uh, in particularly in Asia. Now, you have to remember that not every airline is positioned to become a major carrier, a cargo carrier. It just so happens that Korea, South Korea, is a very export-oriented economy. They export a lot of stuff, in particular from China. A lot of stuff. I mean, if you think about you know the whole Chinese economic miracle over the past three or four decades, a lot of that involved uh, you know growing exports to the rest of the world. And because of where Korean Air's hub is located, Seoul, Incheon, that airport basically sits on the doorstep of China. So it kind of became the gateway for, for Chinese exports to the world. So Korean Air was always you know, able to build that cargo uh, capacity off of that. And then Korea, Korea of course, is an export you know, they're a powerhouse. I mean, think of companies like Samsung and automakers like Hyundai and Kia. So the, uh, and they, Korean Air actually, they talk about it all the time. Our, you know, auto parts is a very big business for them. So, you know, if you're, an airline in, you know, Portugal, for example. Uh, I just use that randomly. Not that anybody I know lives there, but in Portugal. Never heard uh, of it. No, I never heard of that country. It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, located in Europe, and uh, they do not have a uh, large export-oriented economy. Although they do have a large, I guess, unless you count tourism as exports, but I digress. Uh, so that's the point. Now, there are some airlines, like Air Canada is one, that because cargo did so well uh, during the pandemic, they decided to get into that business a little bit more. So, you know, you have, have some examples like that. But in general, um, not everybody can can be as big in cargo as Korean Air. So they were sort of in the right place at the right time. For sure. And we discussed previously on the podcast, Jay, about Japan and how that is a, a very inbound heavy market at the moment. The weak yen, the relatively strong dollar, causing all sorts of interesting uh, flows of passenger traffic through Japan, particularly in the, in the post-pandemic environment. Are we seeing any of that in, in South Korea? You know, there's obviously the opportunities for Incheon, as we described, as a, as a transit hub getting people elsewhere to maybe slightly more trodden parts of uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, for example, from the Americas. But are, are, are we seeing anything in Korean Air's figures to suggest that uh, there's more inbound traffic coming in from a, from a leisure perspective? Nothing in particular on inbound. I don't think, uh, I mean, remember that uh, Korea, it's not a terribly large tourist destination. There are some places, uh, the island of Jeju, for example, attracts a lot of domestic tourists. There was a time where a lot of Chinese traffic went there, so so it's not negligible. But that's not that's that's not the big story when you're talking about Korean Air. The big story is really comes down to five major geographies, and all of them right now are doing very well. And now, and by the way, we just be very clear that we're shifting this conversation to the passenger side now, because as passenger demand started reviving, I would say in early 2023. Uh, in the, for Korea, uh, the um, you, you have the, the revival begin about then, and then really since then, including you know going into the summer, uh, it looks very 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 good, really on all five fronts. And those five markets are North America, Europe, the ASEAN region that's you know Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Singapore, Thailand, etc. Uh, and then you have Japan and Korea, uh, the other the other two. And you know we don't have to go through them all, but North America, for example, where Korean Air has uh, cooperates very closely with Delta, uh, the they are carrying. Remember, I said that Seoul and Chan happens to be an important gateway into and out of China for for people going to and from there. And right now, there's really not that much capacity left between U.S. and China nonstop. So a lot of that is getting funneled through Korea. And uh, the, as you can imagine, because the supply on the nonstops is so diminished, the yields have to be really, really strong on that. So very strong right now in North America. Now, a lot of, I think you mentioned this, Gordon, a lot of traffic flowing between North America and Southeast Asia as well. 
uh, through Seoul. And Korean Air is capitalizing on that. You also mentioned Japan. Uh, you know, Korea, Korean Air will tell you that demand f- among Korean tourists to Japan is just on fire right now. I mean, just because of the cheap, yeah, it's so cheap there that uh, the um, it, it's just a really great time to be in that market. And then finally, China. I would say you know the China Korea market itself has been slow to come back. But again, those flights are getting filled with all sorts of connecting traffic, you know, people going from China to New York via Seoul or China to Los Angeles via Seoul. So it's really a a very good news story on the passenger front, pretty much geographically all around. And then going back to the cargo side, yes, cargo markets have definitely cooled down. They're not what they were in 2021, for example, 2022. But uh, at the same time, Korean Air will tell you that the yields are still much higher today than they were five years ago. So it's still a pretty favorable environment. One of the things they mentioned that they've been carrying a lot of are these semiconductors that companies, the tech companies are using to develop artificial intelligence. We all know, you know, NVIDIA is this, you know, stock market superstar because their chips are powering the, uh, you know, all these artificial intelligence language models and stuff. Well, that's, you know, how do, how do they get those to California? Well, a lot of them are, you know, getting shipped through Korea. So uh, that's, uh, yeah, just one example. I mean, auto parts too, uh, pharmaceuticals. So it's uh, right now, it's a very, you know, good story. How long before the Airline Weekly Lounge gets taken over by AI, Jay? Let's, uh, don't say that. We, uh, don't, don't jinx us. <laughs> well, I'm sure you know, machine learning, they're probably listening to us right now learning all of our quirks. So uh, if you are listening, our future overlords, we, uh, well, I don't know. We'll enjoy it whilst it lasts. Uh, they're going to they're gonna have to figure out how to do it in a Scottish accent, though. I'm not sure how those, uh, if those language models can handle that, maybe. I mean, we, we're recording in the midst of the Europe. Uh, European championships, uh, the football, soccer, whatever you want to call it, and Scotland hasn't been performing too well. So, uh, yes, my, my Scottish heritage is a slightly sore point. I may pivot yeah, I, towards I wonder uh, my, 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 my Portuguese residency status allows me to be a Portugal fan as well. Let's see how they perform. I was going to say, I wonder if artificial intelligence can do something about the Scottish football team. Ouch, ouch. Um, <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is not a comfortable topic. Let's discuss another uncomfortable topic, Jay. The uh, This is going to be the smoothest segue you've ever heard in this podcast. Um, <laughs> or is it that the uh, Asiana Airlines and Korean Air merger still hasn't received US regulatory approval? Even the European Union have now given it the nods. I think there's a dozen or so other countries um, that have given it their approval, albeit with some strings attached, which seem to be navigated reasonably nicely. Is this just Washington being a little tricky, or do you think there's actually some some major hurdles that that need to be overcome that, that could be a deal breaker? Right, and and it's uh, yeah. So we went this far without talking about the Asiana merger, and that's uh, the other big uh, aspect of uh, Korean Air's um, strategy, you can call it. And interestingly enough. That's another reason why COVID was, you can say, a blessing in disguise for Korean Air and that it really uh, hit Asiana very, very hard. Now, Asiana, it turns out Asiana actually enjoyed some of the, some similar uh, uptick from the cargo. I think they, they actually posted some pretty decent operating profits. But even before the pandemic, they were really in bad shape and, and their holding company, the owner, Basically, the owners. A lot, a lot of Korean companies are owned by conglomerates, like big. Uh, they call them shables. And the big one that owned Asiana was actually prepared to sell it already before COVID hit. And then COVID hits, and then the prospective buyer backed out, so it was kind of left in a very difficult position. They were in limbo, and that allowed Korean Air to step in, and uh, probably with help from the government. I think the government was, you know, involved in orchestrating this. They uh, they were able to you know get this merger deal done, and that would be a real uh, you know boost to go from really two major airlines to one in a big country. I mean there are other low cost carriers and and whatnot. Um, but now proceeding to your direct question, you know will this get approved? So I think you alluded to they they mentioned um, or you mentioned they they do have the merger does have approval from everywhere, including Korea, except the United States. Um, I saw a recent interview. I think it was Bloomberg at the IATA Dubai event that you were at, Gordon, where uh, the CEO of Korean Air basically said that uh, we expect 
the U.S. approval to happen uh, before the end of October. Now, what that, you know, I in, in my mind, what that triggers is, okay, they're expecting it before the election, the presidential election. Um, I don't know that to be a fact. You know, we'll see. Um, but uh, they seem, you know, Korean Air seems to be confident that they'll get it. Uh, I don't think, you know, if you're a U.S. regulator, I can't imagine this being, you know, too worrisome on the anti-competitive front. But, you know, you never do know until it actually happens. And as our U.S. correspondent, Jay, in your experience, having followed the industry for, without wanting to age you, uh, a, a couple of decades, let's say uh, politely, do you find that any airline aviation related regulatory business is expedited? ahead of a presidential election, or is it pretty much the civil servants will keep doing things at their normal flow? Or do you find that some of these decisions that have maybe been dragging on a little bit can uh, can suddenly uh, come to a conclusion ahead of ahead of November? Right. You never know for sure, but there's always uh, cases where, you know, the, uh, the potentially outgoing administration, now we don't know if this administration is going to be outgoing or not, we'll find out in November. But uh, it's you know potentially they they would like to uh, expedite certain cases so that they can get you know their 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 people to decide rather than the next administrations. Now in this case, do they really you know want to prioritize a like, merger in Korea? You know, focusing on that probably not. So uh, you know I can't imagine this is you know very very high priority. But um, but yeah, it, it'll be on the you know it's on the Justice Department's agenda. Or uh, I'm not, you know, I don't even know that maybe a Department of Transportation uh, merger. I guess it would be Justice Department. I'm not, I'm not sure how that that would be handled. But because uh, I think the some of the joint venture deals are handled by the Department of Justice and not the, oh, sorry, the Department of Transportation, not Justice. But uh, in any case, if anybody knows, you can send us an email. Uh, but someone in Washington is going to be looking at this. You would hope someone somewhere's going to be looking at it. Jay, fascinating as always. Uh, appreciate your insights. And we should say that if you're a particular fan of what's going on in, in South Korea and the wider region, uh, Jay's feature story in the next issue of Airline Weekly will be uh, digging a little deeper into some of the themes in and around Korean Air. Anything else to add on that, Jay, before we head into our break? No, I think we're good. Yeah, be sure to check out the feature article because we'll have some uh, you know, more on uh, just what exactly the Korean Air Asiana would mean, um, you know, what the competitive implications are, and also a little bit of a discussion on some of the low-cost competitors that are making some interesting moves in Korea as well. Sounds good. Look forward to it. Uh, Don't go anywhere. In part two, we're going to be taking a look at which global airlines had the most profitable start to the year. Hello and welcome back to the Airline Weekly Lounge. I'm your host, Gordon Smith, and this week I'm joined as usual by co-host Jay Shabbat. Part one, we were discussing all things Korean Air. Part two, we're turning our outlook even more global, and uh, we are taking uh, a bit of a deep dive into the airlines that had the most profitable start to the year. So Jay, you've been crunching the numbers. What are your headline findings? What do our listeners need to know? Yeah, and just to Give a caveat, a um, uh, little, little uh, mention at first to the, the idea of seasonality here. Keep in mind that the first quarter for most airlines in the world, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, Q1 is, is rather rather weak, rather slow. Um, for, honestly, for, for most carriers, it's the worst quarter of the year. Uh, so don't you know, put too much stock, don't, don't draw too much inference from these, these numbers, but it is interesting to see, you know, which ones are getting, getting a good start. Now in the, uh, in the very first place of all the airlines that we track and we, we track, there's uh, we have a list of 72 this quarter. Um, these are publicly traded airlines. They're airlines that, uh, you know, publish their financial statements where you can clearly calculate their operating margin. Um, so there are of course, very, you know, substantial, a few substantial air- airlines like Emirates, which doesn't report quarterly or, Virgin Atlantic, which, you know, doesn't report or because they're private and, you know, Aeromexico now is private. So there's, there's, there's always exceptions. So, uh, you know, don't, don't take this as a completely hundred percent comprehensive, but of our list of 72, which includes most of the world's major airlines, Bangkok Airways comes in at number one with an incredible 32% operating margin. Now, unreal. Unreal. 32. Now, 
Yep. And, and right behind it in the number three slot is uh, Thai Airways at 24%. So something's happening in Thailand uh, that's uh, lifting these airlines to uh, really unprecedented heights. And it's essentially, you know, a couple of things that are happening there. We won't go through them all, but uh, Thai, first of all, Thailand does, uh, they're a very large tourist sector, does peak in the first quarter. So this is for them, you know, peak, peak season. Now they usually don't do this well during Q1, but, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of traffic that's, you know, a lot of pent up demand that's really, you know, in the, in the thick of coming back or after, after the pandemic. So the demand side is really good. I think there's been a lot of capacity that has been removed as well. Um, if you think of like Air Asia still operating, you know, much less uh, capacity than it was in 2019. Uh, and, uh, you know, at the same time, you have an airline like Thai Airways, which, which went through, which is going through a bankruptcy restructuring, was able to, you know, cut their costs by a tremendous amount. So a lot going on there. The number two slot, by the way, I mentioned Bangkok at number one and Thai Airways at number three. Number two slot is Copa, which uh, nobody will ever be surprised to see them up top. Uh, that's the airline from Panama that uh, always seems to, no matter the quarter, no matter the year, no matter the, uh, you know, whatever crisis is out there, they always seem to produce incredibly strong operating margins. Uh, so there's your top three. And uh, yeah, we can... Go through the go through some of the bottom ones if you'd like. Well, I was going to call Copa steady eddy, but there's nothing steady eddy about number two with a 24.2 percent operating margin. That's uh, an astounding result. And I just wanted to say on Bangkok Airways, you were talking about Thai Airways cutting some costs. Jay, I've only flown with Bangkok Airways uh, one round trip from Bangkok down to Koh Samui and back. And one thing they definitely don't cut costs on is in flight catering. That was a 40 minute flight. And I had a beautiful, this is a, for the avoidance of doubt, an economy. I don't actually know if it's an all economy product or not, but I was sitting in the cheap seats and it was a cheap fare. And I got the most beautiful in-flight meal on a 40-minute flight. And that is from wheels up to wheels down. Uh, and there's some bumpy skies in that part of the world. So you know, you've only really got 15 minutes to play with in terms of actually eating the thing, never mind it having it served. But uh, astounding level of quality of in-flight service um so yeah they don't position themselves as a low cost or a cheap carrier in any no. way They're, i think uh, they yeah. call themselves uh, asia's boutique airline or at least that was the the tagline yeah. a couple of years ago when i was flying with them and but, an uh, extremely unique business model too they actually uh own several of the airports that they serve i think even exactly coast. yeah so they they do that and then they have a very extensive code sharing relations with uh uh, a lot of the European airlines, for example, I mean, airlines from different regions, and they bring people to Bangkok. They also have a, a lot of, um, and this somewhat served them well during the pandemic. They have cargo, they have, you know, gr a big ground handling operation, a big catering operation, which is probably why you got the food. You know, they probably they have their own, you know, catering operations, so they they don't have Whatever to. Whatever they're doing, it's whatever they're doing they're doing it right and they've got some really fun liveries as well especially on their i think on their 319s because they've got some atrs as well but uh yeah you know they're not skimping on the paint jobs and they're not skimping on the delicious in-flight meals so to be delivering all of that plus having a 31.6 alt margin is uh yeah more power to you bangkok airways mm -hmm. okay let's uh take a look further down the list jay um we can obviously go straight to the the, the very bottom was there anyone else sort of in the weeds in between that you think's of particular note for us to for us to highlight for any particular reason, or we can just go straight to the bottom and, and we can keep things interesting. Well, I can mention that Sun Country was the most profitable U.S. airline in the first quarter. Now they do have a lot of Florida routes and you know other Sunshine Caribbean routes that peak in the first quarter, but eighteen percent margin, something's going very right there. They also do have charter and cargo, and um, it's not a strictly you know scheduled passenger airline, but uh, you know, that's an airline definitely to pay attention to. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, the Brazilian airlines did well, but with the help of some sale leaseback deals, which, uh, you know, starts to get a little bit, uh, when you, <laughs> starts to obscure the uh, the real meaning of, uh, you know, a good operating margin. But, uh, but yeah, there's some, I, th I think we covered uh, some of the uh, more interesting ones. All right, let's go take a look at those who didn't maybe have such a strong Q1 with the caveat, as we said at the very start of the podcast, that Q1, especially for uh, more traditional airlines in the Northern Hemisphere, isn't usually the strongest quarter. Um, what were the, the, the notable results there, Jay? 
Well, you always see the Scandinavian carriers, a lot of them towards the bottom, which totally understandable. You know, you can imagine nobody's going to, uh, you know, visit uh, Sweden in the winter. It's, uh, it's uh, these are markets that peak in the summertime. Um, so you have, uh, you know, at the bottom 72, I want to be fair here, but the North Atlantic um, was at the bottom. Now they are a pretty young airline and usually airlines at this stage of the development are not yet public. So it's probably pretty, you know, it's, it's not that abnormal for an airline at its young stage to have these heavy losses. Now, that being said, you know, we won't get into a discussion about North Atlantic's prospects, but I think at some point pretty soon they do need to turn it around. I mean, I think they really do need to have a good summer this year. I mean, if you can't make money on Transatlantic in 2024 this summer, uh, you've, I think you've got some, some big problems, but that's, that's North Atlantic. Uh, Play is also right next to them on the list. Uh, that's the new Icelandic carrier. Iceland Air, interestingly enough, is, is right there as well. But again, that's it's Scandinavia, so let's uh, let's excuse them. Uh, Hawaiian is uh, is very near the bottom. We've talked about their problems, I believe, on this podcast before. Um, they used to be, uh, you know, they used to really make a ton of money from uh, moving Japanese tourists to Hawaii, and that business is, um, you know, just not just a fraction of what it used to be partially because of the weak yen, which makes everything in the U.S. much more expensive. And just simply because Hawaii itself, no matter what currency you're using, has become a very, very expensive tourist destination. I mean, the hotels, I mean, I hear just from friends and people who visited and even colleagues that uh, colleagues at SCIF who, who cover Hawaii tourism, that uh, the prices there are quite, quite unreal. They've just gone up a ton. So Hawaiian's interesting. Um, this one will may surprise you uh Ryanair negative 16% that's uh you're not we're not used to seeing them on any list of uh of anything negative they're usually at the top and i yeah, would say, you, you, you you can only put a plus sign in front of that figure yes and i would say you know everybody calm down take a deep breath it's not at all abnormal for Ryanair to have a bad first quarter but just wait till you see what they do in the third quarter they will, uh, you know, be up there in the clouds with Bangkok Airways. I can assure you. So no, what, <laughs> no worries what about, about that. What about Jay? Those that might be saying, okay, yeah, Ryanair, right like a lot of their competitors, have a, a weak first quarter. Is fifteen point five percent? Is that weaker than normal? No, I don't think how, so. How, 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 how does how, how does that show up against a, a typical Ryanair Q1 if there is such a thing? Yeah, no, it's a good question, and I'm going to um, I'm trying to be quick here with my Excel spreadsheet, uh, but Ryanair in Q1 of 2019 had a negative 17% uh, operating margin. So it's not abnormal at all. Q1 2018, they did, uh, oh, they actually made money that year. Okay, 5%. I'm not sure what was going on, but uh, but no, I don't think. And by the way, in 2019, they wound up with a full year operating margin of, let's uh, roll the drums here, uh, 13%. So very solid, solidly profitable year, despite that ugly start. So no, it's to answer your question. I don't, I don't think that's that they're, they're totally fine with that. It's not how you start the race. It's how you finish it. There it and is, I'm sure exactly. there's, there's, yeah. Uh, and I'm afraid listeners, our production budget doesn't extend to actually being able to include any sound effects of drum rolling or anything else. So uh, maybe, you, you, maybe you, that, maybe the AI will help us there oh, without, yes. without putting us out of a job. That's the sweet spot where it can help us free of charge without actually taking us out of the job. Jay, with just a few minutes left, uh, any other any other notable entries on the list with the uh, you know with a full what was it seventy two airlines to play with? Yeah, you know, where, where are the big European uh, conglomerates? You know, where's the IAGs? Where's the Lufthansa's? Where's the where's the Air France KLM's? Yeah, good question. So so Lufthansa had a very disappointing first quarter. Um, and again, not that they lost money. That's perfectly fine for Q1 for these guys, but negative 12%. And if you recall, they had a lot of labor unrest. Um, that was uh, that really hurt them a lot. So Air France KLM, which is usually, they usually post the worst results of the of Europe's big three. They actually did a little better than Lufthansa. They were only negative 7%. And of course, IAG is, uh, you know, this has been a pattern for many years now. Uh, IAG, which is British Airways, Iberia, Aer Lingus, uh, Voiling, Level, they they just have pulled far ahead of both Air France, KLM, 
Lufthansa. Um, that's the repeated pattern. And once again, in Q1, they actually made money. They had a one per- positive 1%, which, you know, if you're a European airline making money in the first quarter, you're doing something very right. And, uh, you know, we can, th- that's, that's for another podcast, but we know that Iberia, for example, is doing extremely well on their South Atlantic routes. We know that British Airways is doing very well on their North Atlantic routes. Uh, there's, you know, I think, and, and same for Aer Lingus. Uh, so it's, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're in a real favorable position right now. Got it. And we should say that if anyone wants to take a closer look through the airline earnings scoreboard uh, for the first quarter of 2024, uh, it was published in full. Uh, with the usual caveats, uh, in the Airline Weekly issue, which uh, was published on Monday, 17th of June. So uh, if you are an Airline Weekly subscriber, take a look at that at your leisure. And we should also say that uh, our next week's podcast, short of any significant breaking stories that uh, cause us to discuss other things, uh, we're going to be taking a look at the uh, Q3 capacity trends and, and seeing what the uh, the early tea leaves are suggesting in that respect. Uh, so plenty to look forward to. And don't forget, uh, Q3 is just, uh, what are we, less than two weeks away, I believe. So it's uh, it's coming upon us. It is indeed. Uh, Jay, anything else to add from the scoreboard? No, other than to uh, you know say that I'm ready for Q2 earnings to start about a month from now. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll start building the next scoreboard. Fantastic. Uh, just a reminder that uh, if you enjoy the podcast, why not consider a subscription to Airline Weekly? Go to airlineweekly.com forward slash subscribe uh, and you can access a, a free trial issue. Uh, and it's actually one of our most recent issues. It's got some uh, new sections, a few improvements. Let us know what you think. Uh, thanks as always to producer Monica. Don't forget you can always contact us via email. My address is gs, that's g for Gordon, s for Smith at skiff.com. J as always can be reached via js at skiff.com. That's j for j, s for Shabbat. Uh, my thanks to Jay for joining me this week and wherever you are in the world. Thanks for listening and we'll catch you next time. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Airline Weekly Lounge podcast. Check out AirlineWeekly.com for a new issue every Monday and updates on the latest airline news throughout the week.